Yes, thank you, Stephanie. And uh, welcome, everyone. Also, on behalf of the Institute of Coaching, as Stephanie mentioned, I'm Director of Research here at the Institute. And we're very happy to have Dr. Sean O'Connor for today's webinar. Uh, coming to talk about his research from the University of Sydney in Australia. And welcome, Dr. Sean O'Connor. Um, I would like to take a few moments to introduce uh, Dr. O'Connor. Some of you might have met him at the Institute of Coaching Conference last year. Um, but I'd like to say a few words about his work and um, uh, the topic that he'll be talking about, of course, which he'll develop in much more detail. Um, but Sean O'Connor is uh, a lecturer at the University of Sydney, and particularly in the Coaching Psychology Unit, where he's also uh, received his master's and his doctorate in coaching psychology. He's also a researcher and uh, a practicing coach. So um, these combinations of skills and background, I think, are really a perfect uh, combination for um, him to tell us about the work that he's been doing and uh, its relevance, both the research and its relevance to coaching practice, which he'll be going into in detail as we start out the webinar. He practices in individual and organizational development coaching and uh, also is interested in the interpersonal communication aspect and uh, the team dynamics and organizational dynamics and the role of coaching in uh, those contexts. Now, his research uh, has been um, certainly very uh, cutting edge. The ripple effect that he'll be talking about uh, was a study that he um, began a few years ago, and it was partly funded by the Institute of Coaching Harness Research Grant, the grant that we award for um, research in coaching and all aspects of coaching. And um, it was really the first study in coaching to be able to analyze the impact of coaching on several levels. That means the, indiv the individual, the relational, the interpersonal, and the organizational level uh, using the method of social network analysis. Uh, so he has currently taken this research further and uh, will tell us about it today. And again, also uh, reflect on what the findings mean for coaching practice. So welcome, Sean, and we look forward to your talk. Thank you, Irina. Um, and thank you, everyone, for coming in late in the afternoon or in the early morning or whatever time it might be and wherever you're from um, to listen to me talk for almost an hour. Fantastic. Um, I just want to say a few things first of all. First, I want to thank Irina for organizing everything and also uh, the Institute of Coaching for firstly all the support they give to the coaching industry and their sort of translation of research to practice that they support all around the world. So really thank you for having me on board and having and supporting my research over, over the past few years. Um, before I get into some of the details of the research and the application to practice of some of the work that I've been doing, I think it might be good to give you a little bit more uh, context and background of myself and tell you a little bit of a story about how I got into coaching. So I like to think of myself as a, as a pracademic. I'm constantly in practice working with organizations in change and leadership development, but also trying to translate my experiences externally and my experience internally as an academic to applications in all different types of contexts. So for me, I think coaching is one of the, the sciences and arts that translates well from academia to practice. And that's really been at the heart of what, what I try to do in any of the work that I do. So when how did I first get into coaching? So many, many years ago in, in, a previous, um, in my previous careers, I got quite upset with some of the dynamics that I observed in leadership and how key leaders could really influence the climate and the experience of uh, organizational life. And uh, I had uh, some very negative experiences, also some positive ones, but a very few extremely negative experiences. And when I got out of those industries, one of the things that I started to ask myself is how could how can leaders change to try and help 
um, support the others that they work with. And to me it seemed quite intuitive that leaders have this massive influence on the experience of others. But to my surprise when I started coaching, first learning the art of coaching, the focus was very individual. And, there, and while we make a lot of assumptions around the translation of the work that we do with leaders to others in the organization, in fact, when we get brought on board to uh, practice within an organization, often when you speak to HR or whoever it might be that's purchasing coaching, they're asking for more than just individual change. They're asking, they understand that coaching or any leadership development can have an impact on others. They're looking for cultural or climate change. They want the leader to have influence on others in a positive way, whether that's based around performance or well-being, both of which are intimately connected. Regardless of the fact that coaching is mostly individually focused, they do want to see change ripple through an organization. And to my surprise, this has, ne this has never really been um, looked at in great detail. And that sort of started my research journey. So before we get into the detail, I understand that there might be a lot of people out there who come from various backgrounds. So if there's anything that I go over too fast or that I don't explain clearly enough or I come across as too academic -y, please send a question through or, or an explanation uh, through to uh, the IRENA or the, the others that are looking after the um, webinar and then I'll try and get to those in the middle and towards the end. So feel free to ask for clarification at any point and we'll stop at a few points to um, try and clear things up if we can. So as I've just explained, the push for me was about into coaching and then into, when looking at the research that I've, I've been doing was about trying to make, trying to support leaders to be better in supporting those they're connected with. And this led me, led me down a rabbit hole of research which hopefully I can explain to you clearly now. So this idea about how change and influence can, uh, occurs in the midst of such complexity and connectivity was of key interest to me. Leaders, in a sense, are central to this because they have these connections with others more broadly across the organization. So for me, if we're interested in uh, emphasizing well-being and supporting well-being of others, which is a, a primary goal of much of coaching alongside performance enhancement, we need to think about how the influence of leaders spreads across an organization to the experience of others. Now on the surface this might seem quite simple but it's much more complicated than that. And when I was trying to unpick this sort of complexity of interconnection between leaders, their followers and others in the system, um, it, it led me down to some interesting ideas around how we understand systems and how we might potentially work with systems both as individual coaches and as leaders or as even members of any network or any system. So in order to understand uh, the interconnectivity or the connections and relationships between organizational members and how they influence experience, we need a theoretical perspective of um, systems. And there's this saying that says, and I'm not sure exactly where it came from, so please don't quote me on this one, but it's, it's been around the traps for a while. The quality of our conversations determines the quality of our relationships, and the quality of our relationships determines the quality of the systems and organizations we live and work in. Now, my supervisor, when I was a student here at Sydney Uni, and the coaching unit, Michael Kavanagh, he used to say this a lot, all the time, whenever he was teaching us. And really, I never really understood it for a while, quite as clearly as I hope I understand it now. But there's some important components to this that help us understand systems and how we work with others. One is this idea of quality conversations. Now, for those of you uh, who are interested in systems theory, Ralph Stacey talks about um, complex adaptive processes. Um, and he talks about how Local, in, locally, individuals have the ability to manage or shape the communications and interactions they have with others. And what this statement suggests is that those conversations create the quality of relationships we have. And it's the conglomerate of those relationships 
that determine the quality of the system or organization or team, whatever level you want to extrapolate to, excuse me, the quality of that. So there's this almost nested connectivity between the individual and how we choose to act and the quality of conversation we have, just like a coach does with a leader or anybody that they're working with. And that creates a system or a relationship at the first order of magnitude. And then those conglomerate of relationships lead, uh, lead up to a quality organization, one that values, potentially values the quality of interaction and well-being of others that they're connected with. For, for, so from this perspective, there is an opportunity for us as individuals to influence the relationships we have and therefore potentially have a ripple effect out to the bigger organization. Now we can't determine exactly what that is, we can't control exactly what the outcome is of an organization, but with this understanding, coaching becomes more relevant in how it works with others. And the relevance of those leaders' interactions or the individual interactions that they have within an organization becomes more relevant because it helps to shape the quality of experience for others. Now this is all good and well and comes from a sort of systems theory perspective, um, which often provides a metaphor for understanding and some, uh, some particular features that help us understand systems. So I, um, as I move through this uh, webinar, I'll talk firstly about systems theory and, some un and also then into ideas around networks and social network analysis. Then I'll look at uh, in detail some of the research that I've done around the coaching ripple effect and the applications of that in coaching and working with others. And then I'll move into some more recent thinking around network cognitions and the, uh, the maps of networks that leaders hold in their head about how they're interconnected within organizations and how these might influence the experience of others and themselves and how we might work directly with those sort of mental maps of relationship um, in coaching scenarios and coaching relationships. And we'll see, and then uh, hopefully we'll have some time for questions at the end where we can start to um, unpack any specific applications that you have in mind or need explanation of. So please send all your questions in as they come up and we'll organize those in the middle and towards the end, hopefully. So let's try and dig a little bit deeper into systems thinking or the uh, systems perspective or what's otherwise known as complex adaptive systems. Um, but before we do that, whoops, we're not at that point yet. <laughs> before we do that, why, is it, why are these interconnections uh, from the quality of conversations to the relationships of others and to the uh, complexity of organizations or systems important? One of the ways that things spread and experience spread is this idea through emotional contagion. If anyone's ever been caught in a riot, um, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting that any of you started a riot, but if any of you have been near or caught in a riot at any point, you understand that emotions can be contagious, they can be electrifying, they spread through people's experience and they expand people's experience into a broader system. We know from research within positive psychology that um, we have neurons, uh, mirror neurons in our mind and if someone expresses a, what's called a douching smile or a smile that reaches the eyes, an authentic smile, it's very hard to resist. Even if you're on public transport in New York, London or Sydney, it's very hard not to smile when someone smiles at you. From this perspective, that local interaction spreads to someone else and creates an experience which informs how they then interact with others. And that interaction then can spread to others and we get this system of experience that develops from the local interactions that we have emotionally over time and can significantly contribute to our well-being and our quality of connections in the networks that we live and work in. So well-being is in intrinsically tied up with the quality of the interactions that we choose to have with others and if leaders are working with, if coaches are working with leaders to support not only individual well-being but also the quality of interactions that that leader has with others, and I'm not saying that they all have to be happy dappy, but uh, we'll get to that later, because quality means something more than just positivity. But quality interactions uh, that leaders have with others, then we're supporting in some way 
with helping a leader to support the well-being of others in that system and potentially creating um, virtuous, high-performing teams and organisations through that process. So systems theory, what are some of the key concepts? So systems perspective is basically this broad perspective on the dynamics of systems. It's moving away from this reductionist idea and moving towards the idea that the whole is more the sum of the parts. Now I like to think of systems or networks in terms of a spider web. If you pluck one thread, then maybe nothing will happen, but maybe the whole thing will collapse. This interconnectedness across the web of interactions within an organisation, small changes can lead to big shifts or they might lead to no shifts at all, but something will change in the slightest, at least to some small degree. The system, once something is acted on, the system is different. If you pluck a strand from the web, it might not adjust visibly in any way that's, uh, that you can notice straight away, but it is different because that strand is missing. So there is this, um, this relationship between local sort of changes and interactions that help shape and form a system. Now, this is great from a metaphor perspective, but is it enough? I'm not sure systems theory actually explains clearly enough how we can enact some of these ideas in, uh, in the work that we do with leaders and organisations or even the work that leaders do within their organisations. So what are some more of the key concepts? So this idea about holism, here we have a picture of uh, 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 some blobs that were hanging in air that I took photos of at an art gallery. On their own, they don't look like much, but as a whole, there is another level of meaning, another level of order that emerges through how we understand the relationship between them. So there's something between the interaction of the components that's important for us to understand that system. Alone, like this, they mean almost nothing. Together, they start to make sense, and it's that interconnectivity in which higher order orders of relationship emerge from which start to add meaning and this is the same for this piece of artwork as it might be for an organization or a leadership team or whatever it might be. So this idea of emergence, that this complexity emerges from the interrelationship of components of a system. So for example, many of the properties, behaviors, culture, style, etc. of complex systems seem to emerge from the interactions of the system rather than due to the actions of individual actors. So Edelson and others, if you look at this picture on the, on the um, right, the bottom corner there, we can, see if we, we can see the circles and we can see the square, but there are no circles and there are no square. It's just four Pac-Man figures related to each other in a very specific way. It's from the, the quality of those interactions between the components in which the higher orders of meaning or understanding merge. Here we have a picture of a bunch of different coffee cups. Some are flat whites, some are long blacks. From a higher order of magnitude, when we look at the relationships between them, they have this higher level of meaning and connectedness. There is something about the pattern of relationships which allows order to emerge. And I put to you that it's the quality of these relationships when we start talking, talking about human interaction and the way that leaders work with organisations that are important if we want higher orders of meaning to emerge from the systems that we work in. And this means things like higher levels of performance, higher levels of virtuousness, and, uh, and a climate that supports growth and well-being the interactions that happen at a local level between these components or these individual coffee, cu uh, coffee cups or the individual leaders that we work with are important for our understanding of systems. Now there's a, but as I said before, much of systems theory is explained as a metaphor and I've given you a few metaphors there or a few uh, uh, pictorial versions of metaphors to help you understand some of these key concepts. However, there's a religious Sufi saying that says, you think because you understand one, you must understand two, because one and one make two, but you must also understand the and. And when I started investigating how we could operationalize systems ideas 
so that I could start to measure or map the potential influence of coaching beyond just the individual, which I had a gut feeling was the case, and I knew that others within organisations were hoping for it when they work, when they get coaching for their leaders. This sort of saying stood out to me. I can't remember originally where I saw it. So because one and one make two, but you must also understand the and. So what's the and talking about? The and is talking about the space between. It's the space between individuals. It's this quality that we talked about previously. So what's the process of that exchange? Can we start to map that? Can we understand relational data, which is what it's referred to as, which is something that transfers from one person to another rather than just being embedded in the individual? Classical psychology focuses on individual differences mostly and does little to look at, except in some parts of social psychology, uh, does little to look at the relationships between things and the importance that these have for structure. So the and become the focus of my attention in many ways. Excuse me while I just have a drink of water. Okay, and this led to me, this led me to the idea of network thinking and uh, networks and then on to social network analysis. So let's have a look at the definitions of this. This will give us some context for how we can start thinking about applications within coaching and organisational change and leadership development. So uh, network theory or network science, basically it's the study of network representations of physical, biological and social phenomena leading to predictive models of these phenomena. It's basically the study of the relationships and interactions between components of the, of the system. It's about the stuff in between. It's, the, it's representing these in network maps to help us understand the mathematics in a way of how these relationships change, emerge and lead to outcomes for systems. So it sort of places more relevance on what we call relational data, which, is th which are things like communication, information flow, transfer of energy, viruses, perceptions of trust, anything that can move from one object to another object, so it can be uh, trade relationships between countries, for example, or the quality of interactions between one person or another, or the emotional experience that one person has of another, or money that's lent from one person to another, or viruses that are spread from one person to another. All these things are relational types of data that help us develop maps that inform then how things change and spread across systems. And this was very interesting to me because it potentially held the key to understanding how working with a leader might lead to change in an individual's experience with that leader, which then may lead to well-being improvements or performance improvements in both the leader and that person that they're connected to. So let's have a look. So net, um, within network science, structure is extremely important. And we know that structure is important also within our understanding of organisations. So these are different patterns of networks. And there, of course, there's many more complex versions in between. But this helps to understand how there might be significant differences across these different forms. So here we have a centralised network where there's someone very, and I like to think of this as different types of teams or organisations to help me sort of conceptualise this more practically. So on the left we have a centralised system. You could think of this as maybe a leader with a team who controls all information and doesn't share it between individuals. So everybody has to come through them and it can lead to a bottleneck. Now one of the issues with this type of structure, if that person leaves, then the network crumbles. Now in the middle, we might have what's a, a more of a matrix style organisation or a team based organisation in which we have a number of leaders that control the transfer of information from one team to another and it's what we call a hub and spoke system. So these are very efficient, transfer of knowledge and information happens quickly it's also very problematic if we're not talking about information anymore and we're talking about a virus because the viruses can spread quite quickly. 
but you get the idea in that this hub and, in that these type of systems have a natural efficiency to them that are based on their network structure. Now on the far right we have my, what we might think of as a bureaucracy in which there's many levels of, uh, levels of authority required and information has to pass through nearly every person in order to get in, improved in the system or approved in the system. Now these networks are very slow. It takes a long time for one thing to spread from point A to any point B. However, they are very robust in that if you knock out a few nodes, which are the, the points in the system that interconnect, if you knock out a few points, it doesn't matter, there's alternative pathways. Within the middle decentralized or hub and spoke network, if you knock, knock out one of these main hubs, which are key to transfer of whatever relational data we're talking about, then um, we get a disconnected network. So you can see how structure is important. And network science and network theory pay very particular close attention to this. Now, uh, networks within organizations are much more complicated. They're neither, they're usually a mixture of all of these in different parts of the organization, and many of the connections are informal. It's not about the formal structure of an organization. That's not how information transfers. It's about the informal networks, the networks of friendship, the networks of relationship, the networks of interaction, the networks of a history in terms of relationships that people have had with others. These are the networks where transition of information and experience ripple through a system. They may look very similar to the formal structure of the network, but usually not. There's usually some variation. Okay, so let's move on to social network analysis and get a little bit uh, specific and technical here. So social network analysis is just the um, uh, it's just the uh, it's just the application of network thinking to actually measuring stuff, and there's a lot of different uh, uh, complicated sort of mathematical equations and uh, mathematical analysis that you can do when you understand the strength of a relationship between each and every other part of a system or each and every other individual within an organization. And the real reason that I mentioned this here is because this is the sort of process I got to in which I um, started to measure the potential for the coaching ripple effect. So it's, there's a lot of computer packages out there. There's more and more every few months. Um, some of the basic, really hardcore, I guess you could call them ones, uh, UCI Net um, and NetDraw and Sienna, which really, but there are lots of more practical, um, simplified, uh, less statistical approaches which help you visualize these maps of networks. But we'll get together, we'll get to why that might be important for you as coaches, and I'm assuming most of us are coaches here um, later on. So just to highlight one point around some of the things that social network analysis tells us, and there was a very, a very useful uh, HBR article a number of years ago which talked about this idea of bonding and bridging. Just to give you some idea, if you think of an organization, this idea of bonding in a network or a social network is where everyone is connected with each other or closely connected. So this might be a team that interacts regularly on a regular basis quite intensely with each other. They all share the same connections. They're all interconnected with each other and they sort of, uh, they hold these sort of sub-networks within a network. Now bonding is great because it leads to high levels of um, commitment, shared meaning, uh, interconnected activity and this sense of trust. But it can also lead to things like groupthink and a lack of innovation. Now bridges or bridging connections might be the people who move from um, team to team or are central amongst many teams and information might flow through them quite a lot. So they're important because they connect to diverse others, they can be important for creating diversity, and they also create innovation and access to new resources, including things like ideas. One organization I was working with a number of years ago decided to put in place what they called, um, what did they call them? Uh, they were creativity agents, 
And what their primary focus was to attend random meetings. And what they basically did is create a formal position for these bridges in which others attended these meetings and they would then um, share information that was relevant from other meetings that they had or other things that they knew other teams were doing in order to create efficiency and to spread new ideas across the, the quite large organization. Now these are important these are important people because they created more opportunities for efficiency and innovation and they they basically created these bridging positions across a network. Now this is important because where leaders that we are working with are placed in a system may have influence on the impact that they can have on others and therefore any change that they experience through coaching will only be able to ripple to those that they're connected with. So there might be some important work we can do which we can get into more detail later around where the leaders we work with are placed, what connections they create within an organization and how they manage them to be quality or quality connections in order to best influence a positive climate for the team, group or organization and therefore potentially influence the well-being of others in the system. So we've got a, a brief understanding now so far, hopefully, if I've explained myself clearly enough, um, of systems theory. We understand that there's a metaphor that, while that's a useful metaphor, it, does, it really limits the application of systems theory. There is limits on the application of systems theory. We understand a little bit about network science and how that tries to look at connections between things and now how social network analysis operationalizes that. So now I'm going to talk to you about the coaching ripple effect and how I try to use social network analysis to um, measure the impact that coaching had uh, has on others within the system. And if people are interested, um, the, the paper that was published is available for, for free download. It's open access. The link's there and it will be on the, uh, things after, uh, the slides afterwards. So anyone can have it read in more detail if they feel academically inclined. Um, but I'll explain to you the basics of it here. So what were some of the underpinnings? So obviously coaching. We use a cognitive behavioral solutions focused coaching approach. Um, and I'm assuming most people will be familiar with that. But basically, just like cognitive behavioral therapy, cognitive behavioral coaching tries to work with the thinking of the leaders in order to support their goal attainment. And solution focused approaches are really around uh, maintaining that sort of commitment to moving forward and to finding multiple solutions that help people reach their goals rather than focusing on uh, mining for the root source of the problem as opposed to problem focused coaching or uh, clinical problem focused approaches. So we know that cognitive behavioral and solution focused coaching can influence well-being. There's plenty of research to support that. Now in order to understand how leaders may influence others in the system, I needed a model of leadership that seemed relevant for the influence on well-being that I expected. And so we looked carefully at transformational leadership within the leaders that we were working with. And there's plenty of research supporting the efficacy of, transformation, of the transformational leadership model in terms of performance um, and well-being. So some of the other sort of theoretical and empirical methodological underpinnings. Um, so part of the framework for what informed this was um, the broaden and build theory. This idea that, um, that positive emotions broaden our thought action repertoires or our ability to think and then put those plans into action. And that if leaders had a broader thought action repertoire or a broad, broad, broader uh, options of what to do, um, based on their positive emotions that they experience in coaching or they build up for themselves, then they'll be better able to spread those emotions to others. And there was some, at the time, I was also informed by the research by Lasada and Heathy, but there's been a, a lot of controversy about that since then. Um, but the basics, some of the basics of it still stand. So I was looking at ratios of positivity to negativity of the interactions between uh, organizational members um, across uh, the system that we worked with. 
And we've talked about systems theory or complex adaptive systems theory and social network analysis already. So I know there's a lot of detail on these slides, but uh, you have to excuse me, I'm an academic, I can't do without my slides, um, but it's more to remind me and hopefully to remind you afterwards once you get a hold of them to refresh your memory. So what was the research we ran? So this was formed part of my um, PhD uh, and was supported by one, one of the Harnish grants. Thank you very much. This could not have been done without them. Um, and what we did is we, there was this, I'm just going to explain one of them here to, for, uh, to simplify things. There was a couple of networks that we worked with. So this network was a, a, a sector within the university that also had um, an external facing customer service area. I'm just trying to maintain confidentiality as much as I need to. Um, there was 280 members in the network, 160 of them agreed to be uh, involved. But we had network data on nearly 280 of them. 20 leaders experienced coaching. They had eight sessions over a 16 to 20 week period. And we had a whole bunch of measures. This included things like um, <coughs> psychological well-being, the riff and key scale for those who are uh, interested in scales. And we also measured things like goal attainment and goal progress, as well as 360, uh, we used the MLQ, or the multi-leadership questionnaire, which is a measure of transformational leadership, which is 360 leadership questionnaire for all the leaders, as well as uh, goal attainment measures and the well-being. We measured well-being for everyone in the system that participated, and the social and network analysis was done across the full network looking at the positivity and negativity of experiences or interactions with each and every other person. Basically, how that works is you get a whole list of everyone's names and you're asked to what do, how often do you interact with this person and then, and then rate the positivity of those interactions in general on a scale of 1 to 5, rate the negativity of those interactions on a scale of 1 to 5. Then we had a, a negativity to positivity ratio which then we use to create the network map of the quality of relationships across the whole system. Because everyone rates each and every other person that they uh, interact with. So it's multi-connections. Um, so we had a baseline period where we measured everything and we waited because you, can, you only have one system. You have to compare it with itself. We waited and did nothing, measured again. Then we started the coaching and then we measured again at the end. It would have been great to do follow-up measures but we didn't have quite the timing or the funding to do that. I hope to do that in the future with other programs. So this is what it, hang on, oops. Right, so some of the basic results. From the leadership, the individual level findings for the leaders, we saw increase, significant increases in um, the psychological well-being of all the leaders who received coaching. And remember, there was only 20 that received coaching. We used about four to five different coaches to um, uh, provide the coaching. Um, we saw increases in transformational leadership on the 360 reports, which meant to me that at the well-being level, they've changed how they feel. Psychologically, their well-being's improved compared to base, that baseline period. Transformational leadership changes, because that was 360, that meant that others were seeing them differently. So that's my first level of spread. I know that they're not just feeling different, they're behaving different because others, otherwise others wouldn't see it. And we also saw some massive increases in um, goal attainment. So people uh, got to the goals that they set for coaching. And just uh, for further information, the goals that they set could be anything they liked. As long as they had something to do with leadership and the quality of their experience. So it was that broad. So uh, the reason why I did that is because I wanted to be able to translate this to any coaching that people do in organizations. Sometimes organizations control the goals and I, and, off, and I know that that often doesn't work and there's an art to coaches translating that control to autonomy so that people can have a sense of, um, a sense of autonomy and ownership to those goals. So I wanted to keep them in an area but be as broad as I could. And I think we were able to do that because there was all sorts of different things that people worked on. Excuse me. 
So we saw improvements in leadership on well-being, transformational leadership behaviours, and also their goal attainment. So they were feeling different, doing things different, and being experienced different by others, and progressing. So this is, and then we looked at the network analysis. This is what the network analysis looks like. It's a crazy graph, I know, but um, I'll just explain some of the points to you here. So here we can see um, the sort of diamond, yellow diamond shapes. These are the leaders that were coached. Mm -hmm. The circles is everyone else, the blue circles is everyone else in the organization. The uh, red lines and blue lines are negative inter highly negative interactions versus highly positive interactions are the blue ones um, based on a ratio. The size of the symbol indicates the increases in well-being over the uh, intervention period. And as you can see, there was the closer people, what we found out is that yes, Leaders perceived, and I'm going to skip over a couple of slides in a minute because I'm explaining it here with a picture instead. I think it's more useful. Um, leaders felt that their quality of interaction improved based on the coaching and the intervention. The well-being on average for all the leaders, some not so much as others, but the, remember this is scaled, they all improved. Some of the, the well-being improved for all the leaders. Now, though, when we looked at general well-being across everyone in the organization, we didn't get a significant result. I was hoping that the ripple effect would be strong enough to reach everyone. That was a bit naive um, because it was a big organization, 180 people we had these measures on and um, only 20 people coached. But when I started to look at the local networks around those that were coached, some, some very, uh, not very surprising but very important data um, came to uh, came into view. So it turns out that the more closely connected you are to the group of people that were coached, the higher your increase in well-being. So let me, this is tricky, so let me un help you understand that uh, carefully and make sure I'm explaining it carefully. In an organization, you might have a formal leader, but often, in, in any hierarchy, you interact with more than one of them. It turns out if you interact with more than one of them that had received coaching, then your well-being improves. So it's not just the formal leader that you work with, but the, the, the number of leaders that you interact with that inform your experience, which makes sense, right? So the more interconnected a leader is, the more influence they have on the well-being of others. And therefore, the more interconnected a leader is that we coach with, the more influence their, the coaching has on their well-being of others in the system. So the pattern, the architecture, the structure of the relationships of a leader that's embedded in the system matter for how coaching influences the experience of uh, climate. And let's get this straight, it's the leader that's doing the work. We can't give all the credit to the coaching, but we know coaching can help leaders and then it helps leaders do the work that they need to do. So through coaching, there is a ripple effect of well-being um, experience and experience into well-being of those that are interconnected with the system. So this has some very important implications and in many ways turns on its head some of the assumptions that we make about coaching. So I just might flick through a couple of slides. I've talked about this stuff now. I've generally talked about this stuff, but I'll, I'll stick on here while I say a few things. So what are some of the implications for this? Traditionally, you often hear bandied about within the coaching industry that I only coach the person in front of me, I only work with the individual that turns up for coaching, and that's all I can have influence on and that's all I can work with. Now this, is this has been a protective factor. That, uh, that is important for our commitment to who we're working with, but it's, it's a naive view of how systems work. And many, even some of my own colleagues, have argued this fact, and I'm pushing against it. If we know that coaching influences leadership change, and we know it does, and it influences the well-being of others, and now we know that it influences the well-being of others that the leader's connected with, then we have a responsibility to take seriously the potential for coaching to have an impact on the system. 
Now there might be some all sorts of legal implications, but it also has other implications of around the idea of who we're actually coaching for. The push towards this individual focus of the impact of coaching has kept coaching safe for us. It's helped us ignore the complexity, but I don't think we can do that any longer. And if we're really taking development serious and developmental approaches to adult experience seriously, then we cannot do that without the system. And much of the stuff that we do with coaches, coachees, sorry, much of the stuff we do as coaches with coachees is about how they work in the system. So not clearly taking at least a, some portion of responsibility for your impact as a coach on a system is really limiting the effectiveness that you can leverage around change for the people that you're working with. We're often asking them to experiment, to work with things, to do things differently within the system. And what the coaching ripple effect now suggests is that there might be some importance, or there is some importance, around how a leader is embedded in that network structure. This suggests that we could, and, and I can, conduct a network analysis to look at the network positioning of a leaders and suggest to an organization, if you want better efficiency for your coaching spend, you should think about where the, co where the leaders are placed in the informal network to best have influence across the system because you could get a group that's more best spread across an organization to enhance the interconnectivity of the coaching influence and therefore change the climate of the system. Now this hasn't been measured directly, but it does, it is, um, there is an inference towards that from the, these research results. And it is something that I've done practically and stuff that I'm working on empirically, hopefully in the future. So what are some of the other implications? So it has implications towards our responsibility. It has implications for how we understand the embeddedness of where we work with leaders. But it also has some important implications for how we work with leaders to understand the networks that they're embedded in. So after this research, I started to think about it. So what was it about the leader and the, um, within the network that might be able to influence this process? We already know the quality of their interactions and their well-being, but I started to look for something more. I'll just quickly check the time to see how we're going. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so this moved me into another area around the leadership and networks, and more specifically around uh, network thinking or network cognitions of leaders. So what might that look like? So we've got another 10 or 15 minutes of talking and hopefully some time for questions. <coughs> um, I might have to speed things up a little bit. Sorry about that. Okay, so there's, so that we know that there's a re, some robust relationships between network structure and man, managerial and team performance or outcomes in a number of different ways. So how a leader is embedded in a network is important for things like information exchange, the flow and diversity of information, Reputation, who you're connected with and, and, and uh, interact with, inform who knows about you, so therefore informs your reputation and, there, and then the amount of influence or support that you might get for different projects, approaches or ideas. So we can, <coughs> we can use this information, so it's imp this sort of understanding of networks is important for leaders because it helps them identify and utilize organizational resources, so this idea of opportunity recognition. So if I understand who's who in the zoo and who's connected to what and who has relationships with who, then I might be able to identify opportunities to work with others or get resources from others. And this has particular um, importance for change management and creating effective climates, as well as innovation and creativity. The more heterocentric, or sorry, the more homocentric versus heterocentric our information is, or the, or I guess the more shared our knowledge exposure, or the more diverse our knowledge exposure is, the more, the more or less opportunity we have for innovation and creativity. And there's a whole bunch of research at the bottom there that references that. So when I was starting to look at this stuff, I stumbled on this idea of accuracy and network cognitions. And they, and the academics talk about uh, social role activation. Um, 
but basically what we're talking about is maps in our heads around the relationships with our others and how accurate they are. Because through things like social network analysis, you can uh, map these things by asking everyone else in the system about their relationships and then you can get a leader or an individual's version of that and then you can see how accurate their version of that is compared to the average of what everyone else says, which gives you a reality versus a cognition. It turns out that cognitively accurate leaders are seen to hold more power in a network, they're rated as better performers, but it's a chicken and egg situation. We don't know if they're in those positions within a network or they're accurate because they have more power, so therefore more exposure, so therefore more feedback to adjust their network thinking, and, or they're better performers so work with others. We don't know which comes first. Now there is implications for leaders and organizational members in general around a lack of cognitive accuracy. Politically, we can create more political chaos through not knowing who's connected to who or the quality of relationships between each and others. And also we can get political advantage if we understand the importance of different relationships to each and every other person in an organization. This helps us to function differently, work strategically, and actually is informative of our development. Um, this is a little bit of an aside, but anyone who's interested in de uh, actual development coaching around um, adult development theory, as we go up in orders of complexity, we start to integrate more systems of our experience. Now, I believe that network cognitions are a pathway of doing that. It's a pathway towards systems thinking because it helps us start to put maps together of bigger and bigger complexity that we can apply to our experience and that feeds back into our development. And as coaches, we can help leaders do this. And if we're helping them develop, if we are working with them, and I mean develop in a very specific sense, I mean if we're helping them to include higher levels of complexity of their experience in their decision making, uh, in line with things like Keegan's adult development theory, then uh, we can do that through helping them map networks and create more accurate network cognitions. And there's a number of predictors of network accuracy which have been identified in the literature, but I'll, you can read those in more detail from these articles at the bottom here, or I can answer some questions if anyone wants to, specifically at the end. I just want to get through a few things. <clears throat> so one of the important things that I stumbled along when reviewing this literature on network accuracy and sort of network thinking is that there are a number of common distortions that we make around our understanding of how we're embedded in a system. These are important because if we're working particularly from a cognitive behavioral solution focused coaching approach, and I know that's not the only approach, but cognitions are always involved in coaching no matter how much you try to avoid them. Um, cognitions are there. If we understand some of the cognitive distortions, we can look for those and help people reframe their cognitions to more effective approaches. And this is directly how it's relevant to coaching and working with leaders or anyone in any system. So we often see ourselves as closer to the center of a system than we actually are. We're all a little bit narcissistic. We, and that makes sense because we more, have more experience of the connections directly around us. We don't have that much experience on those that we're not directly connected to. So developing maps, working with cognitions and working with uh, graphs of social interaction and relationship within our systems helps to expand that. Those we perceive as important, we assume reciprocate the connection. So if I believe that I have a quality connection with you, I also believe that you perceive that connection as of quality with me. So we think because I like you, you like me. Or because I share information with you, you share information with me. But that's not always the case. Now if, we're, if we have high accuracy in our network cognitions, then we, it tends to be right. What we determine, what we think is the case, more than likely is. We also see these individuals that we're connected to as, have, as having connections between them. So if I like someone or I'm friends with someone, and I'm also friends with someone else within an organization or I respect someone and respect someone else, I also tend to assume they respect each other because that's my experience of them. But that also might not be the case and that's a, co a common cognitive distortion. Uh, we also attend to different network aspects depending on history and experience. 
Uh, this is the idea of emotional memory or experience or assumption. And this is quite useful in coaching more generally anyhow. When we experience someone, the, our first impressions count. We know that. And if we have an intense emotional experience of them, for example, maybe an argument in the meeting that didn't go, or some resistance in the meeting that didn't quite go to plan, then um, <clears throat> that informs every interaction we have with them from then on. And it's very hard to reshape that unless we reanalyze the relationship. And you can do this by setting tasks with leaders to reassess the relationships they've established and to take away some of that historical influence or that emotional memory which says, I remember you, we had this interaction, it was intense, that's how and who you are from here on in. And by making those cognitive, make, bringing those cognitions or thoughts to the surface, we can start to uh, shape them and change them to be more effective. And this idea of role risk aversion in that we, um, we don't like to challenge our perspectives of the connections between us and the system because we have this level of discomfort or fear around potentially losing status or, uh, or potentially affecting our status. Now we try, and this is important because it avoids us facing the truth in a way because we assume a level of status that actually might not be correct. And that then informs how we interact and how we work with others. So, what are the, so let's start to get into some of the implications or applications more specifically. And I'll go through this a bit quickly and then we'll have 15 minutes for questions hopefully. So how do I suggest, how do I suggest we might start working with this? And it seems we have a few questions now so that's good. I'll go through some of the implications now and then we'll have a break for questions. So. Um, <clears throat> How can we work with <coughs> cognitive frameworks of networks with the individuals we're working with? And how can we work with systems more, uh, with our leaders within systems more generally? So one of the things that we can help do as coaches is, is ex increase exposure to heterogeneous knowledge and information. We've got to help them take multiple perspectives. We have to help them understand that diversity and difference are keys to innovation and creativity. And so we can set tasks, homework exercises, approaches that are relevant to the goal at hand for a coachee so that they begin working with a broader perspective of others or a broader range of different people from different backgrounds, different parts of a business to, so that they become a connector. And this can have a great influence on their uh, performance as a leader as well as their influence on the system, both politically, strategically and more conceptually. We have to start challenging cognitive network schemas. So one of the ways that I do this with the leaders that I work with is get them to map the network of, so say that they're trying to create a more uh, uh, innovative team dynamic or a more positive climate of relationships in their broader team. You might ask them to map out the quality of relationships or positivity between each and every other person in their team and then more broadly the other teams. And then, or the sharing of information if it's creativity and in innovation that the goal is around. And then ask them to test that. Ask them to say, how do you know that it's really the case that this person has a positive relationship with others? I want you to look at some important individuals within this network we've mapped out and say to yourself, is that really the case? What evidence do you have for that behaviourally that tells you that that's the case? And that way we avoid historical information that may be twisting our perspectives and we can reconstruct the network cognition we have of those relationships to make it more accurate. Now you can't make it completely accurate unless you get also access to the team's perspective on these things. And some leaders are willing to do that and some leaders can actually ask people these questions in order to get like a complex 360 of the experience of the, organi of the team. Other things we can do include things like designing innovative network engagement processes and I'm, I'm, I'm writing articles about this at the moment which hopefully we'll extrapolate it to in more detail but it's about engaging the clients we work with in ways that you collaboratively come up with different ways they might be able to work with this system and to work with the network. So I'll give you one brief example. I was uh, using a strengths-based approach that was looking at 
the conglomeration of three teams into one mega team. There were some redundancies involved. Um, I worked with the leader to identify, and it was mostly their idea, but we started to map the strengths of the teams and then using strengths-based approaches, look at strengths complementarity, complementarity, which is what strengths complement other strengths, and then in order to get the network to start to have interconnections across the three previously disparate teams, they cre he created projects where they, each member would pair up or create small groups with others where they had complementary strengths that they could work on this project together and understand some of the strengths, and then they get to use their strengths, understand their strengths of each other, and also they create an, a positive experience of potentially high performance, because we know strengths-based approaches work, that also gets them interacting and creates these connections with their team. That's an example of designing innovative network engagement processes. Um, <coughs> expand network cognitions for accuracy and effectiveness. I've already described and explained that. Supporting coaches and developing team-level shared network cognitions. If they can work as a team to understand the relationships, uh, the information sharing, or whatever relational data is relevant for the network that they work in, if they start developing team-level shared cognitions around that, then they have a shared perspective of how the team works at a systems level. And this can help with the systems thinking of the team as a whole. Now, you need to have a knowledge of systems thinking and networks in order to approach this uh, effectively, but I think that we're moving to that space. And for the brave coach and the, and the informed coachee, this, that approach can be very effective. Um, supporting the development of focusing on accurately perceiving and identifying important network subsets. So this is, again, just about network accuracy. So this idea of exploring and resolving network dissonance, um, so this comes from the idea of cognitive dissonance in which our actions might be incommensurate with our thinking and that leads to a pressure to push towards either the thinking being the same as the acting or changing the acting to be the same as the thinking. Now if you expose real data through the testing of networks and the accuracy of networks, then you may create a network dissonance around people's perceptions of who's who in the zoo, who's connected to who, and what are the quality of those relationships. Um, you can work with that dissonance to help them create uh, innovative network engagements, for example. And then this last idea around perceptual network exploration, which is network sampling and engagement, which is just getting, which I explained before, which is just getting them to test the reality of what they think is the case around the connections of each and every other person. Okay, so there's some ideas and there are some more here and there's also some more here but I think it might be a good time to stop for some questions and really expand on some of the applications I've begun to talk about. Hopefully I haven't gone too far over time. Um, so. I'm not sure exactly, and then I can, if we have time, I can wrap up with some of the research that I'm conducting at the moment and um, some of the things that are moving forward. We do have some uh, early data that coaching can actually shift uh, network perceptions to be more accurate, but I've got more data coming in currently, so um, that's a, uh, we have to put that bit on hold, I guess, but that, that's happening at the moment. So, um, Irina, is it okay if we stop for questions now? Yes, absolutely. Uh, we'll t we'll um, address some of the questions. And I also wanted to mention that if we don't get to all the questions or are not um, you know, completely answered uh, during this webinar, we'll also share them with Sean and uh, he'll see them and, and perhaps um, continue the conversation. Uh, but thank you so much, Sean. This is really such a, an impressive study and, and so interesting with all the complexity. I have to say that I was listening as if I'm reading a novel that I can't put down and want to find out what happens with all the characters and all the relationships in them. So um, thank you very much for the interesting webinar. And um, and we do have some questions uh, that I will share with you and maybe combine some that are similar so that we have time to cover them. But going back, uh, if 
um, you remember to the network diagram that you had to, that you sh showed us with the different colored squares yep. and the changes. Yes, perfect. Um, certainly very interesting. And it's very interesting, Yelja mentioned that you really, the study kind of turns on its head some of the assumptions about coaching and what we take for granted or we used to take for granted in some of the coaching um, literature and understanding. Uh, and particularly these um, interesting findings here that you have some negative interactions yep. that are described with, the, that are illustrated with the red line. But yep. also there's an increase in well-being, right, according to um, your, your analysis, especially yep. to, uh, regarding the people that are closest to the person that was coached. So is this mm -hmm. a contradiction, or how would you explain it, and what are the, you know, okay. what are the assumptions about how this plays out? Okay, I'm really glad you brought that up, because that was something I forgot to talk about. Uh, so thank you. Um, so one of the things I didn't say earlier is that while the leaders experience the interactions as more positive on general with everyone, everyone else experienced the leader's interaction as a little bit more negative, actually. And it seems like a contradiction, but I don't think it is. And uh -huh. I'll explain why. So what happens is that leaders change, and we've got measures of that here, so they start to behave differently. And even though others in the system experience the interaction as a little bit more negative, their well-being still improved if they were connected to more than one leader or if they're connected to even than one leader. So the more embedded they were with leaders, their well-being improved. But they still felt that their interactions got more negative. And this actually is a very important implication for how you work uh -huh. with coaches. So what the way I understand it is this. A coach works with a, co a coachee. The coachee starts doing different stuff in the system, starts leading differently, starts challenging others, starts trying to uh, delegate more, starts giving more autonomy to others. And the others say, hang on a minute. You've changed. I don't like this. This is nice. We've established a way of working together. And systems naturally resist change at some point. I don't like using that term, actually, but there is, a, there is a, uh, almost a stability that uh, systems try to maintain. And, and, they, and so they have to renegotiate the uh, dynamics of the relationship, and that's a bit hard. And so we perceive that as being a little bit negative. I think if we got the follow-up measures, that might have gone away. Because well-being is about more than just happiness or positivity and negativity. It's about meaning and connectedness and how we make sense of our experience. The coaches are challenging their leaders, to do th uh, their others that they're connected to, to do things differently. And this changes the status quo. And in the longer term, that leads to higher well-being because we're moving in that positive direction. But in the short term, it means I'm experiencing discomfort with our relationship because you've re renegotiated it without my attention or intention. And so the implications for that are this. We need to prepare systems for the change that comes from the coaches, which oh. means we have to ask them to sow the seeds of expectation. When we do three-way meetings with leaders and stakeholders, we have to gain their support to support the, the change in the individual. And we have to actively uh, identify this to our leaders so that they can expect pushback and so that they might be able to uh, pre-prepare the system for that change by saying, for example, look, I've just engaged a coach. We're going to be working on some challenging stuff. This might mean that I challenge you differently at some points. I try to do things a diff bit differently. It would be great if I could get some feedback from you guys as we go through. But just know that it might be a bit bumpy as I try to become better in my leadership to support you guys. And then we might negate some of that intent, uh, uh, that uh, reactivity and actually engage a more powerful, powerful process. But again, mm -hmm. it turns on its head the assumption that we're only coaching the leader. Right. Right. Yes, very interesting. Um, and you've had, this, this was a question by Tracy, and to connect it to something else that uh, you said in the beginning, is this what you mean when you said um, 
roughly that quality of the relationship means more than the positivity of the relationship. Um, yeah. And, yeah. And, and so what what else is it that that just um, assists in terms of quality or understood in terms of quality? So you mentioned the yeah. meaning of the relationship. Yeah, that, what a great question. Okay, so um, um, so yeah, it's, this is what I meant. So quality isn't just about being nice or being positive. Quality can be it's about support and helping someone yeah. develop. So if we have a quality relationship, if we see that as quality because it helps us grow in some way, it supports us in some way, um, and you can attach this to all sorts of things like self-determination theory and other stuff which we don't have time to go into. Mm -hmm. But the quality of that relationship is determined by how it positively influences that other individual to flourish, I think. And there's a few different angles you can take on it, but it's not just so if a leader challenges me, and that helps me think about myself, change how I interact with the world and what I do, that might not be so good because I'm a bit lazy, but in the long run it might be positive or of quality because it helps me become better. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what quality relationships are. A quality parenting relationship is one that establishes autonomy in the child, helps them explore the world, helps them grow and engage in ways that are autonomous, not one that does everything for them. And why mm. that's more, the former is more challenging, it's that growth that supports the well-being and the emergence of that person over time. Okay, thank you. Thank you, absolutely, that's very interesting. Um, and we have uh, some more questions, and we have a question from Angela. And she asks, so how would you summarize um, the conclusions from the research to somebody that would potentially be hiring coaches, particularly in terms of, for example, the impact on well-being that um, you know, your, your study shows? How would uh, you be able to link that in order to make an argument for individual organizational well-being and performance, the impact that it would have on that? in order to um, to argue for the importance of coaching for that organization. Okay, um, yeah, that's a bit of a complicated question. Hopefully I can answer all parts of it. Um, let me just, so remind me if I miss a bit. Um, so how would I summarize this for individuals trying to sell coaching into an organization or organizations trying to get coaching? And um, yeah. how do I relate it to performance? I think that was most of it. Um, so right. some of so some of the aspects are that coaching does have an impact beyond the individual, and the quality of interaction and connections that a leader has or develops through coaching will impact the experience of others they're connected with. Identifying what relationships need to be improved or what needs to be built of more quality, more specifically will help to create the spread of well-being to those individuals in the system that might need it most if they're connected to those that are coached. Now there's other research, which would be another whole other lecture, on the relationship between well-being and performance. But we do know that people who are high in well-being have higher levels of engagement, and high levels of engagement equals higher levels of performance, extra role activity, a commitment to an organization, longevity in an organization, all these things save money and make money for businesses. So if it's that performance argument you're looking for, the connection is from leader to connectedness to quality interactions to improvements in well-being and well-being to performance. Um, but we don't have enough time to review the well-being performance literature here, but uh, there's plenty of it out there and it's sort of been the underpinning for effectiveness of coaching and the focus of well-being in organizations more generally. It's sort of uh, uh, irrefutable now to some extent. Um, <clears throat> does that, did I, did, I hope that answers the question? I think so, yes, I think so, absolutely. And, uh, and you've also given us so many resources to come back to in your slides. And um, as I said, we'll collect the questions also and share them with you. But um, this has been really such a rich and intricate 
and um, and presentation of your elaborate, really complex research, and it's been uh, fascinating to um, listen to you talk about it, and I know how excited you are also about going forward. So we um, look forward to uh, hearing your further talk probably uh, at our next conference in 2017 in October uh, next year in, in Boston. We look forward to seeing you there. And I really, really appreciate um, your time here. And thank you so much for sharing uh, all of your reflections and findings uh, with us. Thank Great. You so thank much. you very much, Irene, and thanks for having me having me along. Um, if anyone wants to stay in touch, um, it looks like I will be in the U.S. Um, in October for the IOC conference, and probably doing a few workshops and things around the place at the same time. Um, there's a link to uh, the Coach, Coaching Ripple Effect paper, and if people want to contact me, feel free to. I can put you on a list for when other research comes out. There's a lot that's under review at the moment around network cognitions and other stuff that I've been working on. So um, okay. thank you for listening, and it's been a pleasure as always, Irina. And feel yes, free to send any been. communication through to, me, through to me. I'm more than happy to. It, to it, it has been wonderful uh, for us also. Thank you, everyone who joined our webinar today. And uh, make sure to um, look at our next webinar. Actually, the first author here of the Sage Handbook of Coaching that just came out. Well, actually, yeah, this just came out. Um, Tatiana Batskutova will be our next webinar presenter in December. And I wish you all a um, good night or good afternoon, depending on where you are in uh, around the globe. And or good morning, actually. For Sean, it's early morning <laughs> now in Sydney. <laughs> My day is uh, just starting now. <laughs> your day is just starting, right. And thank you, everyone, and we hope that you will uh, join us again.